how you doing, Adam? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I'm glad that I reached out to you. Um, I just started following you on Twitter not too long ago. And uh, I put a, a quick little post asking people if anybody was interested in talking about this Top Slam Digital, which I, as a longtime wrestling card collector, know nothing about. Sure, yeah. And so I, I did a little bit of homework since you said you would uh, a, a agree to come on and talk about it. And I am blown away by looking at eBay pricing on an actual product that I can't ever have in my hand. Yeah, a lot of people are surprised when they see that. <laughs> a lot what, of people are surprised when they see that. What is it? What is Top Slam Digital? How does it work? I, I guess it's an app. I mean, what, what's all, what's it all about? So back in uh, I want to say 2012, because I was one of the first users on the original game, which was for baseball, uh, Tops Bunt, and it eventually became Tops Huddle, and then Star Wars, and then UFC, and then wrestling, and then a whole Disney, Marvel. They've really got a ton of brands they've built out and i think back when it originally started it was supposed to be um like a, a play along game with baseball that tops could use to you know be kid friendly in packs and have like and basically tie the physical um and digital world together as they were building out their direct to consumer program which has exploded over the last probably five to ten years and really what it turned into was Tops Digital, which is like a platform of games that is all, they're all very similar. So if you know how to play one, you probably know how to play them all. Um, and it's really become two separate uh, entities. One is like the sports games, and then one is the entertainment side of it, which is more focused on collecting and um do they push wrestling into the entertainment side or sports yeah yeah okay, because I, they don't they don't have a way to so like with the baseball and what used to be the football they they canceled it or they lost their license i think this year um so what they used to do is they'd have games go on and i think they still do for baseball as the games are played you there's an actual like game that you play in the app to it's like live live fantasy. So gotcha. um, you you put like let's say I collect a card of Mike Trout or I collect a card of I don't know name a player Fernando Tatis whoever and as Tatis goes up and hits a home run I put all of his cards in my lineup and I score points based on what he does. So if he strikes out I lose points. If he hits a home run I get a ton of points, right? Mm -hmm. And the people with the most points win prizes. That's the sports side of it. So that's been going on for almost uh, eight, nine years now. And the entertainment is started with Star Wars. So Star Wars launched around the first of the sequel trilogy. So the, the Force Awakens was like the first um, real exposure that this app had in the mainstream. And what it ended up being was an app that didn't have a game along with it. And it, what it morphed into was, hey, we can do this for all of our licenses that we own. So we're going to release more games. And that eventually became UFC, which is another license that Topps has. It became wrestling, which Topps has a license for. And then Disney, which Topps is a part of with their uh, alignment under Tornante brands and stuff like that. So there's, there's a lot of um, focus across their digital platform to incorporate all the licenses that they have. And really what uh, wrestling has become is a digital collecting app. Now, is if you are a card collector so if you go and buy packs of cards and you own cards and you've done cards since you were a kid like the concept of this is going to be really really difficult to understand because it's hard to separate the physical card that you have in your hand from the digital one that you have uh in the app it is for and, me yeah so a lot of people are like why what what's the point of this like i i can't own the card they don't send me the card if i collect it in the app like why do i do this and um the answer is it's not collecting it's a game so if you think about it as like a game and entertainment and stuff like that it's easier to separate that it's not a physical sort of uh, experience it's a digital experience where you literally just try and get you know every card that they release or whatever and think about the amount of think of the way that most of the digital apps out there incorporate in-app purchases. Um, Tops has really done that with. A, and if there's a whole South Park episode you should watch about the freemium gaming, that's what this is. It's just basically Tops has found a way 
to get people to spend money on cards that they don't own and that they they're literally just pictures in an app but it's it's fun because you know people have created a community around it i created a website that i don't run anymore but it was like how i got involved with uh the top team and being able to communicate with them directly and get give them feedback on the experience but like it's it's created like this whole sort of community of people who all participate in the app similar to like what you would see for reddit or what you would see for um you know some of the steam games that are out there right it's insane to me i i it just it's again you, you you said it right which is like i as a long time collector I, I can't seem to wrap my head around it like yeah, you know it's very uh, it's, common yeah it's uh i i don't i guess get a jpeg into my app is basically all i'm getting and think about it so think about it like this card collectors are actually not their target market their target market are people who just like play super card or play i don't know if you've ever played wwe super card it is a i know the game as, yeah. It's a hugely popular WWE app that has millions of engaged users on a daily basis, more than all the top apps combined, because people like playing digital games when they, you know, are on the, you know, they're on the bus, you know, driving to work or, you know, whatever the kids as they're taking a break from school, love playing these games. My son plays them all the time. This new one among us and fall guys and all these other things. Like they just (laughs) love, you know, dicking around on the internet and playing these games and the, what tops has found a way to do is really sort of incorporate that into collecting, which I don't, I mean, like, I think a number of years ago, I would have said it's the next big thing, but there's been a number of challenges that they've gone up against that. I don't think it's truly going to ever get there again, but um, yeah. Well, when, it's, I, when it's I talk to other card collectors, uh, I guess, like you said, it's not their demographic because there's card collectors, but I talk They're to not, them. Yeah. I, I have not met a single person that's like, endorses it and goes, I love this, or I, this is great. Or uh, I, I collect these things. I mean, and you say kids, it, it's a kid. It's not like it's trying to be demographic. It's the kids, but when, ki- how, no. how do you have kids? <laughs> no, it's not. It's uh, the demographic is very much the wrestling demographic. So the 18 to 49 demographic, um, there's really? a lot of, yeah, there's, a, there's kids on there, but it's so complex and the economy and the game is so complex that um, kids struggle. Kids will struggle and have struggled. And I mean, when you have merchandise out there, not even merchandise, it's like this, it sells for $500. You're really not mm-hmm. a kids friendly type of thing. Well, that, that is uh, probably a little expensive for that card, but um, like the sold the, the, the <laughs> that's <laughs> unusual, but the, um, the challenge that people face with coordinating this with their previous collection is that um it's hard for them to wrap their heads around it, as you said, but it's also hard for them to justify spending the disposable income on on cards and cards that they can't own. Um, what the people in the app sort of tend to understand is that the money you spend is for entertainment purposes, not for longevity purposes. These are never meant to be collectibles bought and sold on the secondary market. Just like, you know, if you if you've ever played Madden Mobile. Madden Mobile is this hugely complicated uh, economy and the economy itself is as much of a game as the game is. And so like Tops has kind of done a very similar thing where it's the economy of the game is part of the game. So like being able to get good trades and the user to user experience is, is really a part of the game and you pay for the experience and entertainment. You should never think about Tops as apps as I'm owning this card forever, because that's not it's, the way their TA, they, they're- It may not really. be designed that way, but I can tell you it sure is being traded and sold that way. Uh, when you can go to through a, 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 a complete a listing of, of stuff that have actually sold on sold on eBay. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, people sell, like there are a bunch I mean, of cards I mean, that have sold. I mean, there's all these are like, I mean, $500 is what the best offers accepted. So you have to imagine somewhere around that price point. I mean, it's just card after card after card you want to call it that it sells for hundreds of dollars yeah and it's because the the cost to get these cards is that much money now <clears throat> i would say search for top bunt top bunt the cards are probably five to six times as expensive as this if not more the, the more popular the player and the, the lower the circulation is the more that it is and um the reason that 
that happens is because of the in-game economy is so competitive. And I'll give you an example. So my main physical collection is Becky Lynch. I love collecting Becky Lynch. She's always been my favorite since 2016 when she was called up. And, um, you know, I try and collect as many of the Becky Lynch cards in the app as I can because, you know, it's just fun to do. And um, being that I've seen the evolution from where it started to where it is now, I mean, it's, I have a, a, a lot more experience with the in-game economy. It's just fun to, to, like I said, it's fun to dick around on there and trade with people and talk to people and do those things. It's really changed over the last few years because their daily average user base seems to be on a huge decline um, just because people have become kind of fed up with the lack of change and really no real improvements over the last few years. So there's been uh, a number of people that have left, but there's like, high-end collectors that will spend i don't know probably five six thousand dollars a month just pumping coins into these packs really and it's yeah and it's just it's just like any digital game so there's like it, if you don't have experience with digital gaming you're not gonna like this will all seem to be absolutely crazy and it's really inter introduced me to a lot of that um, experience because looking at what's going on with supercard and looking what's going on with um mad mobile and even just like you know the different fun games that you can play on your phone all of them now offer in-app purchases and that's where all of this that's where tops funds the apps through is that if you buy you know the the currency in the game then they make money off of that and they pay a portion of it to wwe obviously as a licensor but they also pay to Apple or to Google for their for the usage of their store, mm -hmm. and then the rest of them is just pure profit because the the only people that the their only overhead they have is the people that design the cards and the server space in Azure or AWS. So like, there's not really as much overhead as there is to actually create, sign, and ship products. So it becomes just as fast as the artists can turn them turn them out, and they've gotten really good at that. So well, I mean, there, with, our, with our tops now license, I mean, I mean stuff that's, you know, within the next day you'll have a new card. I mean, right, exactly. So like, think about, <clears throat> so the way that I think about it is back in 2012, this was never supposed to be a moneymaker. It just seemed to be like they created it to get a tops app into the store. Like that was the goal of this whole program. And what it has since become is like a, a say for 2014 to 2015, it was as big a producer of uh, you know profit, I would guess, is some of their smaller licenses that they own. Like it was crazy to see how much money they were able to make off of Star Wars and all the much money they were able to make off of Bunt and Huddle, which are their baseball and football apps. But you know, there there was a lot of uh, turnover within the digital team, and then there was a lot of pushback from collectors who saw them exploiting some of the the uh, challenging aspects of the in-game economy to their advantage they didn't like that so i don't know does this uh in in your eyes does this have like a, a longevity is it going to be around for years and years and years to come is this where we're going to stay we're going to go so i was like my site if you if you look back at my site back around those times like i was fully convinced that this was the next evolution of trading cards um because it was all direct to consumer there was no distributors there was no you know, warehouse space to house unopened cases of product, right? It was all digital. And with the lowering of costs around Microsoft's um, cloud and, and Amazon's cloud to, to host this stuff, like I could see this becoming the, the main moneymaker for Tops. Now, no one could foresee the pandemic happening or any of, of those things happening. And the in the 90s coming back around for a second go electric boogaloo style. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> like I, I didn't no one expected that. But I think similarly, like there was there's a period in 2014 and 2015 where they were getting national news coverage for the way that they were producing Star Wars cards. Now, how that sort of factors into wrestling wrestling to a degree, I would say right now is is pretty far down on the totem pole of tops like it just is because it typically has been for always 
Right, because and, it was and, never and fact, every manufacturer has ever had it. Even with FLIR, it was. Even with Comic Images, I exactly. mean, as small as Comic, it was. I mean, you know, Comic Images, Olivia was like their big thing, and, and yeah. you know, Hot Wheels was even <laughs> bigger, and and Conan was bigger. But and look at how much those cards are worth now. But I think the, the the with Tops, like their their main license is baseball right now, and it and back when this really first got going, it was baseball and football, and then they lost that to Panini and. Um, I think the and then Panini started putting out digital apps. So Panini actually has similar digital apps that go about this much more in a collecting fashion, right? So um, if you are trying to wrap your head around how do I make the connection between physical collectibles and digital collectibles, the Panini apps are probably a lot more up your alley because they're they're they've started using blockchain and stuff like that to show forever ownership of a digital collectible, which Topps still hasn't quite figured out yet. And, um, I, but I think their audience, because of how much Topps had dominated things up until that point, their audience is so much smaller that it almost doesn't matter. So I think the, the but we're in wrestling terms, like, like I said, wrestling is kind of far down the totem pole. So this was always just like, hey, let's do the app because we can. And like, it's seen, like that's the way it's seen. Um, And that's the way that it's performed. And that's the way that it continues to be a part of things like the, the baseball app is still the most important with star Wars, a close second, if not flipped at this point, I don't know. I haven't followed those apps in a while, but then there's like Disney and Marvel, which are hugely expensive licenses. So obviously they have to put more time and energy into those to make sure that they're meeting the the expectations of the licensing costs where UFC and tops, just like in physical trading cards really aren't, um, as big of a deal and the the apps kind of feel like an afterthought in that respect but i think in a lot of ways like it just it, it had a million dollar a billion dollar runway and i think they've turned it into a million dollar runway unfortunately because of the mismanagement of a lot of different challenges that they face including the 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 recession uh type in collectible recession that happened around you know 2012 and 2013 with uh, some of the lesser brands that they've owned and now that it's come back i was just talking with uh, i reconnected with a few guys over there and i was just telling and he was like hey we don't need to change anything we're having the best year we've ever had and i'm like dude you got to be trying not to have a great year right now like yeah. you should be having the best year you've yeah, ever had everybody you've is. Mi- you probably left thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on the table because of the the ways that things have been managed and um you know it's really unfortunate because i think this was a huge idea it was a huge concept with digital cards because they're there you could have um alexa blitz and the fiend partner up and the next day have a card where in real life that's a 10 month turnaround period correct and who knows their storyline might be over to the point where they're not even going to produce those cards right that's right so there's like that that ability to create collectibles um, and make money off of events happening in real time is unheard of. I thought yeah. that was a, a, a revolutionary. It really idea. is. I mean, being able to have uh, something really on the fly as it happens is uh, is amazing, actually. Um, what, what happens if uh, Tops decides not to renew a license? When it, you know, it just happened, actually. <laughs> so um, the football app um, had like been... If, if I'm a collector of WWE cards and all of a sudden... Mm-hmm. I mean, I know they just signed a new multi-year deal with WWE, so I, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But if I'm a collector and all of a sudden they decide they're not going to renew a license with WWE anymore, are what happens to my digital cards? So uh, the way that it happened in football is all the cards stay there, but there's nothing new that comes out. So basically the purpose of the app and the content delivered within the app stops and the economy stops and – it's just a few diehards that stick around. And I, I don't think that there's going to be any real value to those cards long-term, unfortunately, because there's a lot of people who spent thousands and thousands and thousands upon thousands and thousands of dollars to get those cards that now have zero value. Yeah. Cause now you're like, we just shared, we showed that, uh, you know, there's all these people selling stuff on eBay and all of a sudden their stuff becomes worthless. Now. <laughs> well, I, I think it's, like people can't think about it from the terms of like, these are forever collectibles. Like these aren't like everybody used to collect cards to pass them down to their kids because they were investments. Mm-hmm. That should never be the way that people think about digital cards. It's all about the entertainment experience. So the way that the, the wrestling apps and the football apps and the Star Wars apps, you become one of the top collectors. You want to have the clout in the community to say, I have this many Becky cards. I'm the top Becky collector. Now, like, 
So now we're talking about who's who's got the bigger dicks that we're talking about. Exactly correct. Yeah, that's the whole like I said to Topson a number of years ago that exploiting the vanity of their community is going to make them the most money and they went a completely different direction. Like I was like, if you started showing leaderboards and you started putting up um, so like there's a collection score in the game where it shows you I own this many cards and the, the collection score is a combination of a number of different factors, which no one knows. Like no one knows what goes in, into making somebody's collection score higher or lower. But if they actually took the time to build a coherent, you know, scheme around how we rank people within their collecting community, these collecting apps would have been explosions. Like people would have competed to be the top, you know, Alexa Bliss collector or whatever you might want to call it. And there are people in the apps who have 100 collected scores, right? So that's supposed to be the top of the top. And, you know, they have a ton of cards. But there's no, no one would know who they are unless they actually like went and sort, you know, searched them out. If Tops actually found a way to play on the vanity of their community, then that would be a completely like different it seems situation. Like from, a, from a design standpoint, it seems like a exactly. very simple, simple thing to do. And, and my biggest complaint is that the app hasn't changed fundamentally since 2013 or 2014 and even then it was a small fundamental visual change artistic and aesthetic it's not that the concepts of the app are still what they were five to ten years ago and that should never happen if you look at candy crush the iterations of that game is still being you know sorted out with every update that they do tops is just we're gonna make a couple of visual changes here and there until they make this drastic change which happened like a year ago to which was designed to kind of reset things and all it did was just throw a wrench in everything like it was just a it was just a complete mess but uh i and i used to be a wholehearted supporter of this like full-throated top of the soapbox like well, everybody yeah, you made a get... whole website devoted to it man you fully exactly you fully i had believed thousands into it. yeah i had thousands of readers come to my website every day i created relationships with everybody in the community and everybody at tops because you know, I, I acted as a resource because I loved playing these games so much. And I really, I, I still play the wrestling one every so often just because I'm a big WWE fan. But I mean, it's just passive at this point. I don't spend the money that I used to spend. I used to spend a shit ton of money and I don't anymore. How do, I mean, so does somebody need a shit ton of money to get into it now? Um, like, like how, how would somebody, whole... if, if I was interested in getting involved in it, just because I want to, uh, uh, like, I'm, sounds cool. It sounds this, how would I get involved in it? I mean, is it worth my time? Um, a, a few years ago, I would have said, oh my God, get into it yesterday. But now, I mean, it's hard. And the way, reason I say it's hard is because the in-game economy has been changed by this recent update to the point where they've, so the, really what drives value in these apps, in any of the apps is, is three things. And that's the person on the card, the circulation of the card, so how many copies of it exist, because they do limit the amount of people that can own a certain Which, card. by the way, and I hate to cut you off, but which, by the way, I have a problem calling it a card. <laughs> yes, fair, fair. But I, 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 get it. I know what you're talking about. Digital yeah. collectible, yeah. But for the simplicity of the discussion, we'll call it a card. So, like, they call it, it's it's, it's referred to in the community as card count. So, if the, the lower the card count is, the, the more valuable it is. And the more uh, attractive the subject is, whether that's Roman Reigns or um you know the fiend or whoever like those are the more the more popular they are the more valuable the lower card count cards are and you know you collect a set and you get a reward for collecting a set some of those are really rare now the, up until last year there were cards that only had like i have cards in my account on the, on the wrestling one that are one of one right yeah. so there's only i'm the like, only like one that owns, card yeah i'm the only one that owns that card and the challenge is now they've for whatever reason, they have moved completely away from limited cards in the app. So like every card is now available in a timer and they've used pack mechanics, um, like how the cards are delivered to limit count and limit circulation. And I just, I absolutely hate it. It's, it's become a complete buzzkill in every way. So like Chrome, for example, Topps Chrome is a really popular baseball product. It will be a popular wrestling product if it ever gets released coming up here. Um, they did a version of it in the app 
And I was commenting back and forth with the team. I was like, listen, you have an opportunity to really do some damage here with spending because people will want these cards if you build it the way that the physical team has built their cards, which is, you know, the super refractors are one on one. Then there's like red refractors, which are like five. And like, there's a parallel structure, right? Sure. Which, and by I the way, we've, that, had, we've had discussion on, our, on this show talking exactly. about, we, we hate parallels. God damn, we hate oh, parallels. Okay, well, I, I love them. So I'm, <laughs> I, I'm very <laughs> different You're the one that. guy. <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, uh, that's a whole different subject whole different altogether. <laughs> because I think it's the thing that makes wrestling cards fun to collect yeah. is, is collecting the whole rainbow. But anyways, um, they, in the app, I was like, if you take that approach, um, it becomes a completely different money making opportunity for you. And they were like, nah, we're just going to do it the way we always did. And they, and they've made it just pack mechanics to limit the, the circulation. But the cards are still valuable because some of the cards are, were cost a lot of money to pull. So like if you open packs in the app, it costs money to open the packs or costs in game currency and the in game currency can get expensive. Um, so like there, there were cards that were still valuable, but not as valuable as they would have been had they done it right. And so I said to them um, that that was just a huge missed opportunity and they just really didn't care because they've changed the entire economy within the app to be more focused on people having cards rather than wanting cards. <laughs> if you, if you catch my drift, yeah, so it yeah. used to be like, oh, I really want that card, but there's only a hundred of them. So I'm going to have to trade all of these other cards just to get this one card. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'll give you an example. So back when Finn Balor was called up in 2016, they released a, a demon card. Okay. And the demon card only had a hundred copies. And at the time that was the lowest counted card in the entire app. So people were paying like $150 for it. Cause there's only a hundred of them and the packs were really expensive and whatever. Um, and now none of that type of card exists. So if you wanted to get into it, you have a lot of opportunity to get access to cards that you never would have had access to before. That's what they're banking on. They're banking that you're going to find that experience attractive and entertaining. What they don't understand is that the people are in the app to have cards that no one else has, and they will pay money to have cards that no one else has. So if everybody can have them, then what's the point of having the, sh the, the shit in your oh, that, account? That, that's the eBay sales. Right. Well, the eBay sales don't really factor in it at the same rate as they used to because every card is available for an indefinite amount of circulation as long as you're willing to pay the money to open the pack gotcha it's it's a weird concept and it's just uh but having this conversation with you has really opened my eyes to it more so like i have a full understanding of it now so um it's just it's weird. complicated yeah it's it's not the simple explanation that people expect it to be because like if you get involved with any community-based game whether it's an rpg or an mmo rpg or any of these other things like there are things that you have to understand and there's preconceived um concepts within the game that exist to drive a community towards a certain goal like that's what digital gaming is all about is driving a community to do things that the company wants you to do to spend money or to collect or whatever and i think tops had a really big opportunity to, to if they had gone down the path they started on and continued to drive things the way that they used to they would have seen uh, a huge increase if they had just kept going that direction with some tweaks instead so like I, i'm sorry to keep belaboring this point right. but in 2014 star wars um was the golden goose like everything they put out in star wars was selling for like a million dollars like it was crazy because they had like hundreds of thousands of people playing the game every day and when you have collectibles and only have 100 copies like that creates a huge demand with a sure. very small supply the economics of that is ridiculous well what they started to do was monetize aspects of the game so that you could just straight up just hit a button and buy the cards you wanted rather than using the packs to actually drive the circulation. Sure. So they, were, they're, long, they're, they want the quick cash now. Right, exactly. And that was what the executives at Tops, I guess, were, were so driven to, to continue was, I want to know how much cash is being generated every single day. How do we get to those numbers as quickly as possible? And the way that they did that was they would release multiple variants or parallels a day of the same card with the same picture, just a different like colored border sure. on it. And as a result, the entire user base revolted. And I mean, 
the toxicity level on social media was unlike it was like ea level toxicity right <laughs> and um and so that pendulum which had started really kind of tilted back towards like we want you to collect and have fun spend your money where you can get fun cards have a good time but spend money to we only care that you spend money so this pendulum swung all the way in this other direction so then once the entire user base revolted and they started to realize that they couldn't monetize the app to the point where they were reaching the same heights that they had before they decided we're going to swing the pendulum all the way back over here which is we're only going to release cards with unlimited card counts it's going to be like anybody can play anybody can collect we're going to remove the whole monetary element of the game which for you know a year and a half had been all the way over here not here and so you have this giant trade economy within the game of people who had spent the money to be here now experiencing a game that's here, which creates as much frustration as this. Yeah, you're, so like just, there was you're, no you're frustrated <laughs> the other half now. Right. There's no happy medium. <laughs> and like the the freemium model is you have a community of free to play individuals, and then you have a community of pay to play individuals. And they the the utopia is that they interact with each other and have a good time. Mm -hmm. The reality of the situation is that each resents the other. Because the 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 pay to play people don't want to go to a bar and pay you know for top shelf liquor and get the same experience as somebody who's not who's getting water and glasses of water for free right it shouldn't be the same experience at the bar but sure. they want the same both want that same experience and it's just and that just never worked and so really they they took the, the pendulum and then kind of brought it back a little bit but it still never reached that happy medium and because it's here and not here the whole thing has gone to shit so is there uh, obviously any way to repair it? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's an easy way to repair it, and that's to swing the pendulum. And like they refuse to do it in any of the apps. I think they've taken a few shots with baseball because they recognize that the community is older. Um, and when I say older, I mean older in tenure, not older in age. Mm. Um, so like they've been around longer in the baseball app. They feel like they can take more risks. Um, but I've heard that the the app coding is isn't as friendly to some of these things, and it crashes more easily when there's a huge influx of traffic. I don't know. That's just it's. I've heard a lot of rumors, and it's just never taken back off because the the aspects of what made the game fun in 2014 have completely gone away, and the aspects of what made it fun, you know, to to be a part of the trade economy then goes away with that because all the older users that you used to have friends and communicate with, they're all gone. And me included. So that, that's incredible. It's uh, I did not know that the levels of the complexity of of this app and this game. I really didn't. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the thing. Like no one really. And, and there's, there's really no marketing towards that either. Like uh, typical there fashion. There used to be. There for, used to be for for the baseball side or for wrestling. Um. So there was for everything, and they used to, and that was the other really challenging thing that I never understood why they never took a shot of was combining more elements of the physical and digital together so baseball and wrestling at one point offered like um, when you opened a pack of cards you could get like an insert that would have uh, an anchor in the digital game so like you could like um, there's two different anchors there's one is you can give a redemption for packs in the game mm -hmm. or you can give a special card that you can then redeem in the game. So baseball was the first to really do this, which was they released a set of physical cards that had special inserts, really tough to get physical inserts where you had a specific code that gave you that card in the game, which was absolutely awesome. That'd be I great. My friends and I, I think we opened like four and a half cases of it. It was you're really because you're, now you're bridging two different aspects like right, that with digital because, and physical now. So you have to buy to buy. <laughs> right, exactly. And I said, and the funniest thing about this was that um, no one in the app could figure out where these cards were coming from. Because like I said, their target market is not card collectors. So all of a sudden you had this group of card collectors who also play the apps that are like, oh my God, I need to rip through as many of these packs as I can because these actual physical redemptions are awesome to have in the game because no one else can get them. But you're not, but you're not having the digital players are not, are not going they out buying pack. Right, they don't they're not them. going, but that was the thing. And I was like, they didn't get that there was double crossover. There was physical people that could be attracted to try the digital apps and then vice versa, 
digital collectors who now wanted to get the cards that were only available in these packs and would buy physical cards to get it when they maybe hadn't done that since they were little kids. And so I was like, you guys, I was like, you guys need to do this more often. And they were like, oh, it was such a nightmare because no one wanted to work together. And I'm just like, why? It was like, because the teams were so differently set up. The teams, the digital teams was was composed of individuals from digital gaming uh, art, uh, digital art, and stuff like that. They weren't card collectors. The physical team are, are guys that have been card collectors their entire lives and have worked for Tops for 20 years. And mm-hmm. they just they didn't they saw the apps as this redheaded stepchild that no one wanted to be a part of. <laughs> and, and vice versa, by the way. And, <laughs> no, I don't think it was like the. I think the digital teams had a reverence for the physical cards. Like, like when I went and talked to them, and I, I've I've done a lot of different things with Tops over the years. And like when I would talk to them, like they understood the importance of Topps' history in the physical element of card collecting. What they didn't understand was why those individuals didn't see them as equals, right? So, you know, it's tough. And so those, that one set, it was one set that was released for baseball and it never was released the same way again. Um, they've had like inserts in uh, 2017 or 2016 tops and then now forever that had like little app codes that you could redeem for packs, but there was never like a true physical digital crossover, which was an enormous missed opportunity, but likely hard to coordinate and hard to execute. So that's like a, that's a win-win right there. And it doesn't make any sense to me why you can't make that happen. Why the two teams can't get together and make that happen. Now, coming from a, from a, a text background, I used to work for AOL as a programmer, quality mm-hmm. assurance. I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to get different teams to communicate, but you still make it happen. It takes some time, but it just yeah, sounds like these people the don't want to do that. Works. I don't think that's the way tops worked. And from my experience in working with both the physical side and the, and the digital side, they were two different worlds that, you know, just styles clash. And I think it was, um, it, it was, a, it's unfortunate. Like, I, it could, I could see it. Like I could see the, the, the huge runway that they had in front of them. And I could see how many people would latch on to each side of it. And they just, it was too much money and too much time and too much coordination. And this was during a time when Tops and Panini and Upper Deck and all the card companies were struggling to stay afloat because no one was buying cards the way they were in the nineties. So they were trying to make like the digital team was famous for doing a lot with very little. And I think the physical team um, saw them as like they were, they had, um, it seemed like there was a lot of different um, concerns around money being allocated for digital applications versus spending that on product and more autographs or more relics or whatever you sure. want to put in those cards. Why do I have to, why do we have to lose part of our budget to digital knowing that uh, we could be spending that on things to make our products better on the physical side where that's where the money is made. Now for that's where this whole Star Wars situation really complicated things because for a while Star Wars was making buku bucks. And uh, and with no overhead or few smaller overhead. Yeah. And so that was a tough sell for uh, I'm sure a lot of people on the physical side was like these guys are churning out millions of dollars a quarter like you can't take that away mm-hmm. so you got to give them the money but then once that all dried up it became very different so I don't know that's incredible that's uh I have uh, definitely learned quite a bit from this conversation <laughs> on that side. But I didn't, again, the levels of complexity for the game itself like that just seems like uh, it's unbelievable to me. I didn't think it would be that. I just buy, I get the app, I get some things, I play a couple games and I get some cards. Like I just, that's how I thought it was. But yeah, and I think I had the experience of being able to talk with these guys and, you know, I, I never understood the challenges that they faced on a lot of different things like uh, the apps themselves um, were really well designed and really well maintained uh, from a coding perspective, but there was still like human error. And these guys, you know, these guys are humans. And when they when they made a mistake, it's like the collectors just completely flipped out. And they always made good on it, but you know, it, it took time because that's what happens in the real world mm-hmm. when it's actually a human pressing the buttons and you know turning the switches and flipping the levers. And um, you know, it, it seemed like they were just facing an un undue amount of toxicity from the community because they weren't delivering per, a perfect product and i think from a digital perspective collectors that were part of this community felt like they should be getting 
the, for the amount of money they spent, they should be getting a perfect product. But there are error cards on the physical side too, right? We said those sure. are some of the most valuable oh, cards yeah. that you can have. I, we have a whole conversation <laughs> lineup for another discussion talking about the Tops Now product lines like that and the errors they have in that. You know, just again, same thing, you know, physical or digital, you're still going to have errors. Tops, I, I don't think Tops, just let me say right up front, I don't think Tops Now would have happened if it wasn't for Tops Digital. Like I think Tops Digital was the front forerunner for all of these new direct to consumer avenues that Tops is exploring with marketing their product it's really crazy and um you know the the things that ha that they've been able to accomplish in the trading card side of things a lot of them harken back to uh what the digital side went through in the original stages of their apps and i it's it's crazy to me like that that the the, the collecting base went the direction that it did and that tops i think just failed to adjust and there, like I said, there's a lot of turnover on the team um, because all the people that I used to talk to on a regular basis are no longer there. They've moved on to other jobs. This happens in IT. Like I work sure. in IT too. And like, um, you know, staying at a job for two years is the, like the expected lifespan of any career. So like, you know, when you think about Tops Digital, the continuity of those apps just was really tough to continue being a, a factor in driving new purchases in business because the people were turning over more likely. And I, I listen, I, I don't think being living in New York where Tops is, because that's where the every, all of them were stationed and they opened a, an office in Orlando later on. But living in New York, I can guarantee you that that they weren't being paid six, seven figures, right? No, so no, no. they weren't living the the luxury lifestyle. They're probably commuting from a lot of different areas and doing work at home at you know one a.m. and two a.m. I mean that sucks. Like who wants yeah. to live that life? So I, I that just from my speculation and from my you know talking with them, it, it seemed like um, they had the right formula on paper and just the the way to execute it just never really came to the fruition I thought it would. That's uh, quite amazing, man. Uh, yeah, I, it's a I, fun I, story. It's it's a really fun story, and it's a success story because it started from nothing, and they're still making money today. Like the, all the apps are still there, save the football one where they didn't have the license. Panini had an exclusive football license, so they took that one away. But it sounds but, like if they, if they don't get their shit together, it's like that to continue to make it and make it evolve to a point where it's growing. Uh, it's going to end up like Napster, where it's just like, you know, a foundation of something that becomes really great. And now all of a sudden, somebody else is going to take that concept and idea and make it better. I, I think it's, I think there's a, uh, there's some elements of truth to that. But I think most importantly, I think Tops is still committed on a, a base level to delivering digital content through those apps. They still make money. They still have, you know, thousands. Which is the bottom, of which is the bottom line. As right. Long as it still, still makes money. Like you can like I, I like uh, even though I stopped talking with just about everybody over there um, because they're no longer there. Like I can still look at the public downloads and the public you know factor um, the public uh, spending reports that are available on a lot of different tracking sites for every app and their rankings within the app store. They're still pretty high ranks for sports apps. So I mean they're still making money and I think in that respect, like it's I don't think it's going to fade away in the same way that Napster did because. Um, Napster was never designed to make money. Napster was designed to be, you know, sure. the, uh, a public file sharing tool, right? But it was it was a foundation to what became the streaming Spotify and all, yeah, 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 of all course, that, yeah. and Apple Music, and now it's yeah. become a subscription life. But I I don't think that that's where like I think they're they like you asked like how can you save it? There's a, still a very clear path where I think that they could bring people on board as you know, a fun experience. I think they should, they just need to swing that pendulum back a little bit closer to the middle where it used to be. And they will start to see some of those daily average user counts start to creep up and move up the rankings because Supercard, Mad Mobile, all of these different things, like, man, those, those guys are making money hand over fist. It's printing money with those things. So. Yeah. I, I love the concept and the idea of, of, of bridging the two worlds together, you know, being some way to bring, physical product with a digital product in, in the form of like, uh, yeah I, like a, I think that's a no-brainer it, yeah that's a no-brainer absolutely like that i i, I, but like that I, idea. I with uh i mean you you see the 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 challenges that COVID has brought to the table with producing cards wrestling sure. <laughs> especially um i think the that those types of situations are why those types of things are a huge challenge to execute because the app 
can have things ready tomorrow, but the physical team can take up to 10 to 12 months. Correct. So it's hard to plan game mechanics when you're constantly going through Apple updates because Apple's just about to release a new operating system. Like you can't plan for things that when it, that are supposed to happen tomorrow, 12 months in the future, right? It just, the app life cycle is not that long. It's maybe a couple of days at best, that week at best, right before everything resets. And like, um, so the, the planning elements of that require just an enormous amount of execution and desire from both sides, both physical and digital to execute those types of situations. I just don't think that there's that desire anymore. That's unfortunate, really unfortunate. Yeah. I, I like to see it's like that, but man, I, I really appreciate your time on this subject, man. It's just a real eye opening for me. And I'm sure a lot of viewers are going to probably take away something from this. I'm sure because it's, just yeah, a, I have a lot of opinions on wrestling cards. To, to oh, in I general. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> like this is, this is just the, I mean, like this happens to be in my wheelhouse. There's, there's certain things with um, specifics around trading cards that are in my wheel. I mean, like I've run, like I, I sports cards and censored was my blog for, 10 plus but that blog is older than my children and um and i i mean like i've i used to be the most widely read sports card blog that you know the fun blogs not the professional mm. like yeah. we're doing this for a living blogs mine was the most widely read one for many many years um and i just you know i life life happens right work happens kids happen i got i got four kids so life interferes man yeah so i think the the challenge becomes like you know I, I have a lot of, like, I have a lot of experience with so many different aspects of the trading card industry and manufacturers and uh, the community itself, especially because, you know, in social media, like there are maybe a handful of super users out there that have probably more than a thousand followers. And I've stayed pretty active on that because Twitter has become my life. Like I live on Twitter and like, thanks <laughs> yeah, through, through my blog and through my blog, I've I've gained a ton of followers. Like I have a ton by trading card standards, sure, not by yeah. real life standards. And so, like people see are are able to see a lot of what I I tweet because they followed my blog however many years ago. And you know, my wrestling fandom goes back many many years. Like, I mean, I was you know probably four and five. You know, watching Warrior and Hogan uh, at WrestleMania six and um you know, it, for a while, for 20 years, I, you know, after Stone Cold retired, like I, I left, I stopped watching. And then, you know, a couple of years ago, my son, you know, flipped on Monday Night Raw after catching stuff on YouTube. And my wife, my son, my, like all of my kids, like we gather around the TV still every week now and watch. And it's really, and I didn't realize how much of a wonderful community exists around wrestling cards, because I think the one thing that I've always said is that, um, wrestling the wrestling community is about you know the fun of collecting wrestling cards most of the other sports card communities are a combination of people who are in that bucket but also a giant amount of people who are just looking to make some money yep. and you know make investments and that but, but wrestling cards are kind of turning in that that direction though right now too with a lot of increased pricing in, in the grading which we're not going to talk about that but, <laughs> some, uh, but yeah but, but so this app so this, going into the app again like being a part of that and getting back into like I never really got into the wrestling app until I started watching wrestling again I was always part of the other apps and uh, the community in those apps um, you know was very similar to the communities for the baseball and football cards where the wrestling was much more in the community style of what you see in wrestling cards so I mean it's that that's what drew me to to continue being a part of it because for a very long time I stopped playing all the tops apps and the wrestling one is what got me to actually pick up the phone again and then start doing it but yeah it's a it's a challenge uh, to to see where they go in the future without major adjustments so interesting man really interesting stuff um well i i think we've covered it all cool <laughs> i think we've covered it all adam and i i really appreciate your time on this awesome yeah happy to help and you know if uh if you guys want to follow me on twitter i'm uh at sc uncensored uh, and you can just or just type in gelman g-e-l-l-m-a-n and you can see I, I post a lot on just about everything um yep. and uh and i'm on i think i i think i even um have uh gained a following of wrestling collectors somehow but uh and i i've like an instagram too it's it's funny how that has really become a part of it in facebook 
oh my God, the wrestling community on Facebook is insane. So that's a new element. Oh, that's a new element for me. I (laughs) never really got into that. I never really got into Facebook as a method of of being a part of a card community, whether it's the apps or otherwise. And I, I was legitimately shocked at how much people function together around wrestling cards on Facebook. It's like unlike anything else I've ever seen. Yep. It's incredible. There's so yeah. many different groups to get involved in. It's like that there. And uh, it's incredible, actually. Yeah. So uh, give me a follow. Give me a shout. Shameless plug. Absolutely. So, uh, G-pop. Let's go. G-pop, man. Uh, well, I appreciate your time. I really do. Cool, man. It was, good to, it was good to talk to you. We'll talk to you again soon, okay? All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Adam. <laughs>